uh, hi everybody uh, so today i will be talking about dengue fever i am a consultant physician working at flavors clinic in bangalore um, so before we get into the management per se which is the main uh, you know uh, topic that we are going to dwell into today let's look at why dengue is important and uh, you know in present uh, situation uh, of the rainy season we are seeing uh, quite a bit of a spike in the dengue fever itself so uh, as you know as mentioned here there are nil disclosures and uh, these are for education purpose only and whenever you are going to go for a treatment decision please discuss with the specialists in your hospital and treat case by case okay so let's look at the history and epidemiology of dengue fever so a dengue fever in india per se was first uh recorded you know not exactly diagnosed but a clinical scenario just like a dengue was recorded in madras in 9 in 1780 as you can see and dengue fever was first isolated in india for the first time in 1945 so our first virologically proved epidemic of dengue which is not to be confused with the first clinical dengue like illness the first epidemiologically proven uh, disease that appeared in kolkata was in 1963 and 1964 so it's a tropical disease let's understand about it in the subsequent slides and we can see approximately 503 million cases per year this statistic is not for india it's for the entire world so 503 million cases in a year is quite a significant number in an 8 billion population so the mortality rates range uh, from less than 0.1% to 13% uh, you know case fatality rates so that is quite a significant number and it's a serious disease as we know so now let's look at what tropical diseases are see tropical diseases usually mean the diseases which are restricted to the tropical region why is it so here because there is a lot of uh, rainfall and there is a lot of vegetation we'll be seeing a lot of insects and a lot of arthropod bone diseases so if you see here a tropical zone is 23 uh, degrees north north and south and subtropic is 23 to 35 degrees temperate is 35 to 66.5 and polar is more than 65 lately we have been seeing a lot of cases in uh, england also so that is quite a quite an amusing event because dengue has appeared to spread from tropical to the other regions as well so the dengue virus is transmitted by aedes aegypti which is the most commonly read but the other ones include albopictus and polynesiensis and also the scutellaris complex all of these so these mosquitoes usually the female uh, aedes mosquitoes bites during the day aedes requires the blood so that it can incubate the uh, growing eggs inside the belly of the mosquito itself so when infected the mosquito remains infected for the infective for the next 30 to 45 days which is its life cycle so the entire life it will be infected so dengue virus belongs to a family called flaviviridae the flaviviridae word comes from flavus flavus means yellow okay and it's an arthropod bone virus so it's an important arbo virus okay so the genus it belongs to flavi virus the other uh, viruses which also give a similar presentation of the hemorrhagic uh, fevers include west nile fever tick borne encephalitis yellow fever zika as well as japanese encephalitis so in dengue we have dengue serotypes 1 2 3 4 but a newly uh, identified uh, serotype is de dengue virus 5 which was identified in october 2015 and as we know it's a 30 nanometer single stranded uh, rna virus that's pretty much about the virology so i'll not delve too much into the uh, pathophysiology itself but let's understand some very important concepts so that they help in they help in our treatments treatment decisions so we have something called as a primary dengue which is basically the first time a person is infected with dengue and a secondary dengue which is the second time somebody is infected with dengue the most serious condition the most serious of uh, dengue infections are implicated when a primary dengue is from a dengue virus dengue 1 serotype followed by a second infection with a dengue virus 2 what is the major reason why the patients going to severe dengue there are certain theories of how they happen so the first important theory is that it is because of an anti antibody dependent immune enhancement or ade so what happens is there is a strong association between the development of severe disease in secondary dengue and the and also the observation that complications occur when the viremia is in the decline so when we say viremia is in the decline that means that the virus load is actually low when the complications actually occur so that means the virus itself is not the implicated organism for development of a severe disease rather than uh, that the actual immunity of the person the immune response of the person is what is implicated in that so during the second infection there are uh, you know pre existing uh, antibodies from the first infection but these antibodies themselves fail in neutralizing the new virus that is present for example in a dengue virus 2 infection that's a secondary infection 
a dengue virus one infection antibodies which are preformed will fail to neutralize the dengue virus two infection there and it also increases the viral uptake into the mononuclear cells which increases the immune response in the patients can lead to shock as well as certain other complications which we look into later so the presentation is an incubation that is from the day a mosquito with a dengue virus bites so the virus is inoculated into the human host and it takes about 8 to 10 days for the fever to develop for the virus to replicate then we have something called as a febrile phase a critical phase and a recovery phase so the febrile phase usually lasts for 5 to 6 days a critical for 2 to 4 days and the recovery phase for 4 to 5 days um, so the febrile phase itself uh, is usually marked by a severe sudden onset high grade fevers which can be associated with chills also the temperatures can reach one or four degrees and it can be continuous also. So patients can have high grade, uh, I mean, severe fever and retroorbital pain, which classically the pain increases on movement of the eyes. They can have myalgias, arthralgias and anorexia and other constitutional symptoms, as you can see. There are various types of rashes which can be formed, exanthems which can be formed in uh, dengue virus uh, febrile phase. So then after the, uh, the first four to five days comes something called as a critical phase. The critical phase is important because it is the critical phase where, uh, you know, patients can end up uh, in severe dengue as well. Uh, the onset is usually right after the fever defervescence. So the fever subsides and that's when the critical phase starts. So the moment a patient is afebrile doesn't mean the patient is completely fine in dengue. So we have to look at the presentation on a later stage. So what happens in critical phase is that there is an increased capillary permeability, which leads to a lot of fluid accumulations, be it effusions, pleural effusion, pericardial effusions, be it ascites, all of these can occur. There can be a marked leukopenia, you know, the total counts will go below 4000 per microliter and a thrombocytopenia can be seen in that patient. And there can be a narrow pulse pressure. So the narrow pulse pressure is not necessarily due to a fall in the systolic. It can be a rise in the diastolic, which can which has to match the increased permeability. So it is at this point not possible to predict who will you know have an uneventful defervescence. When I say when uneventful defervescence, uneventful critical phase. So it's presently not possible by any markers or any clinical examination to find out who or which patient of yours is going to end up in a lot of complications. So WHO recommends certain warning signs. These are very important. If there is one slide that I want you to understand from the entire discussion, the important slide would be warning signs. And why is that important? Uh, it's important to understand that in these patients, ones who are undertreated or untreated, they can lead to complications, including shock, including DIC, as well as bleeding and certain other complications also. So what are these warning signs and symptoms? These are given by WHO. Please remember it and make sure that you assess in every patient, you know, post the febrile phase when the patient is entering a critical phase. So you would want to look for an abdominal pain or tenderness, a persistent vomiting or intractable vomiting as we call it. So even after giving on and cetron, the patient will still continuously uh, have vomiting, persistent vomiting. There can be clinical fluid accumulation, be it pleural effusion or pericardial effusion or ascites and all of these leading to breathlessness, uh, you know, diffuse abdominal pain and all of these. There can be mucosal bleeding, which can be a warning sign. A lethargy or restlessness should trigger, uh, you know, all the lights in your head and should make you think of uh, the complications that can happen in a patient with dengue. And patients can also have en liver enlargement of more than two centimeters. This is where clinical examination is, is very important. And we should not just base our decisions on the platelet count or the hematocrit itself, although that is very important as well. So if you look at the other point, it is the laboratory increase in hematocrit and a concurrent rapid increase in the decrease in the platelet count. So we would want to usually look at a more than 20% increase in the hematocrit. So if that is increasing, that is an alarming sign and we have to look at it and treat it as a warning sign. So why are these important? These are important because the WHO has classified dengue in a very different way, which we'll look into later. To understand those different kinds of classifications, we will require warning signs. Earlier, we had dengue hemorrhagic fever, dengue shock syndrome, and all the other you know, uh, different subtypes or subcategories of dengue, but now it is not like that. It's just probable dengue, confirmed dengue, and we have dengue without warning signs, dengue with warning signs, and a severe dengue, that's all. So we'll get into that on a later uh, slide. So the other phase would be recovery phase. After a critical phase of four to five days, patient can enter a recovery phase. Recovery phase usually lasts for 48 to 72 hours. At this point, patient is usually in the uh, in-hospital setting, though they would have received a lot of fluids also. So these fluids, which are extravasated outside, will come back into the intravascular component, intravascular volume. So they will lead to increased urine volume and increased frequency. 
patient will have drastic symptomatic improvement. So the patient will stop feeling dizzy, stop feeling myalgic and arthralgic. Patient will also have a vague itching, the cause of which is yet uh, uh, still under study. Patient can have pulmonary edema if the patient is treated, over-treated with fluids at this stage. So now uh, let's look at the uh, classification of dengue. So we have the old classification, which most of uh, us have studied. Uh, that's the 1997 classification. The new classification, which has recently uh, come into the textbooks, uh, was given in 2009. So the previous classification included a classical dengue, a DHF, which is your dengue hemorrhagic fever. That includes a grade 1 to grade 4, with 3 and 4 being the dengue shock syndrome, and a dengue with uh, unusual manifestations. See, the problem with this classification was they, was, they were very vague. And they did not help in treating the patient. There was no a way you could decide which patient was supposed to be admitted in the hospital, which patient was supposed to be treated on OPD basis, which patient was shifted was to be shifted to an ICU. So on the other hand, the newer classification gives makes it very much streamlined and makes it easier for everyone to understand which patient to be put where. So let's understand the new classification. So the probable dengue is where you have an ELISA, you know, enzyme-linked uh, immunosorbent assay. Uh, which is positive with an IgG titer of more than 1280, which indicates a secondary infection or a rapid increase in the IgM as well. Then you have something called as a confirmed dengue, which is basically an RT-PCR proven uh, existence of the virus itself. And the other ones include dengue virus with warning signs. So when you have dengue virus with warning signs, I've mentioned the warning signs before. So the same warning signs, if they are there, you would want to diagnose it as a clear-cut case of dengue with warning signs. And then we have severe dengue, which are which are marked by a shock, a respiratory distress, a development of ARDS, uh, severe bleeding manifestations, not the minor mucosal bleeding. So there's a difference. The mi minor mucosal bleedings, would, you would want to put the patient in dengue with warning signs. Patient with a severe bleeding would be uh, included in severe dengue. So the liver enzymes, if the enzymes are elevated to more than 1,000, you would want to consider a severe dengue and an impaired consciousness and organ involvement also leads to classification as severe dengue. So why are these important? These are important to base our treatment decisions on. So let's look at the investigative approach. This is more of a, uh, you know, from a practical standpoint rather than from a textbook guideline recommendations. So we would want to have a baseline as we know that we don't know which patient would end up in severe dengue and which patient would end up in complications. We would want to have a baseline of investigations which include a full blood count, uh, urea and electrolytes or renal function. You can also get a liver biochemistry to look at the enzymes, the baseline enzymes. Please get an ECG also, a coagulation profile, which usually we miss until the patient ends up in a very severe condition like DIC or something like that, where we do not have a baseline of coagulation profile. Uh, the other ones include a blood grouping and peripheral smear because we don't know which patients will bleed rapidly. So the additional investigations, these are the baseline investigations. So in a resource limited settings, please restrict to this, this much itself. The other investigations, additional investigations are something like dengue NS1 antigen, IgG and IgM. So we have a rapid test that are, that are usually performed in the hospitals. Please do not go for those. They have very low sensitivity. You would want to choose ELISA over these rapid card tests. Then you can also look for any other uh, tropical diseases, including a malaria parasite, because the endemicity of um, dengue and several other arboviruses is quite closely related to the endemicity of malarial parasites also. So you can also do the other endemically important assays. Now, another important point here is if you are seeing a persistently low platelet and the patient is not having a clinical scenario which is uh, relating to that, you would want to get a citrate tube sample of platelet count. The simple logic being there are times when EDTA sample, that is your purple cap top of the uh, uh, the test tube that you take. So the EDTA sample, patients can have a platelet clumping. So that can lead to a falsely low platelet count when the computer analyzes it. Also, always prioritize manual examination. Talk to your pathologists and find out whether the platelets are clumped or whether you know there, we are seeing any megakaryocytes and all of these. And these are preferred over computer assays any day. So in shock, you would also want to get lactates and uh, blood gases and also bicarbonates. And in severe dengue, you can get an USG, ultrasound, thorax, and abdomen to quantify the effusions and ascites to look for any progression to, to prognosticate. And also get a 2D echo to look for cardiac dysfunctions. Please do not forget to get an ECG. I would want to recommend a serial ECG here because sometimes patients do have arrhythmias and you would want to pick it up as soon as possible. We have a polyserocytis picture as we call it. The gold standard would be RT-PCR for dengue virus, but it has a, you know, it's the most sensitive and specific, but it has a very small window. So you would want to get this test done only in the initial three to five days, because after the first three to five days, that is during the defervescence of fever, 
patient's viremia rapidly falls and rt pcr becomes least sensitive so how do you differentiate a primary and secondary infection that is clearly by igg and igm we all know how and ns1 by elisa can be done as a initial test in the first 4 to 5 days ns1 antigen has rapidly come up to be the most uh, you know go to kind of a test right now and if you find out that the patient is having an ns1 positive elisa you can be certain to some extent that the patient is having dengue and you are dealing with dengue itself so if not there are times when you would you are still in doubt and you would want to get an rt pcr for dengue virus also okay so before we get into what management is we would want to know what management is not so do not treat the patients with papaya leaves extract so again these are not my recommendations these are what have been uh, you know uh, studied extensively and the evidence is not sufficient or supportive enough for us to start the patient on any of these medications unless there is a requirement for certain of them certain few of them so papaya leaves extract definitely that is not uh, you know that is most investigated but however there are no uh, proven therapeutic benefits of the same undue vitamin supplementation is not recommended steroids definitely can become detrimental at times because steroids have been shown to in increase the risk of uh, gi bleeding in such patients you can also look, you know stop nsaids in patients ideally recommend stopping all intramuscular injections because of the possibility of formation of something called as a hematoma kiwi fruits again you can recommend giving fruits to the patients but kiwi per se has no therapeutic benefits in the patient both in improving the symptom symptoms of the patients or in improving the platelet count as well antibiotics please use them judiciously and also doxycycline was previously investigated for its role in cytokine storm in suppressing the cytokine storm but there is no clear cut evidence in improving outcomes in dengue per se antivirals are also not indicated in this case now let's look at which patients you would want to admit and which patients you would want to treat on an op basis so outpatient basis management again these are who guidelines so outpatient managements are clear cut you have to treat the patient outpatient basis only if the patient is in the early stage of disease and patients are not having any warning signs again warning signs are very important here this is why the who has clearly given the new uh, classification so that you can treat the patients according to the classification so in patient management you would of course want to treat any patient with any warning sign clearly admit the patient and treat the patient as an inpatient and any comorbidities or extremes of age diabetes any renal failure obesity and chronic bleeding disorders or coagulopathies you would want to admit the patient any patient who lives alone or can't take care of himself or herself you would want to admit the patient pregnant females do not hesitate please admit the patient and follow up with them and patients who live far from health facility you would want to admit such patients as well for close monitoring of symptoms so how would you want to manage the warning signs so uh, let us say a patient is coming to you with for assessment and you find out that the patient is having uh, some sort of a warning sign so how would you want to treat such patient you would want to first shift the patient to an hdu or icu facility why do you want to shift the patient you would want to do a close monitoring of vitals yes that can be done in your uh, normal wards itself but what about ecg ecg needs to be done on a, a, a on a regular basis to rule out arrhythmias in the patient and to document arrhythmias in the patient and also you would want to do a close monitoring of warning signs the reason why you would want to admit the patient in hdu or icu facility is because you would want to look at the fluid balance so you would want to look at the fluid responsiveness to give the fluids or to stop the fluids when required in such patients so any patient could the dynamic parameters such as passive leg raise or ivc diameter monitoring and all of these and pulse pressure variation you can look into many of these dynamic parameters for fluid responsiveness you would want to get serial hematocrit and platelet count monitoring ideal urine output should be more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour if, if the patient is having anything less than 0.5 volume resuscitate the patient first and you would also want to look at why the patient's kidneys are not functioning to the fullest so the ecg as i mentioned arrhythmias and fluids initially for a patient with warning signs you would want to start at 5 to 10 ml per hour usually i would recommend choosing a balanced crystalloid over a normal saline itself unless uh, there is a contraindication for the same and you can also guide it based on the urine output bp hematocrit as well as the fluid responsiveness indicators so over treatment can lead to pulmonary edema but that should not prevent you from giving adequate fluids so please make sure that you give fluids that's the most important one so apart from this you would want to give antibiotics if there is any secondary infection which you are suspecting and that can be treated only based on the foci of infection attain cultures if and when required indicated and please avoid nsaids and aspirin only if the platelet count are less than 50000 per microliter 
where you have to weigh in the risk and benefit. So uh, other than that, hepatotoxin and nephrotoxins, please avoid in DICs and MARDS cases with severe dengue. And if there is any evidence of major bleeding, you would want to uh, transfuse platelets only in these cases. So we, have, we uh, commonly practice this uh, concept of less than 20,000 platelet count, transfuse the platelets. There is no evidence and it is not going to help the patient in any way. Platelet transfusion is more of a case-by-case -case assessment. So involve your specialist in the hospital and you take the decisions. Patients can have major hemorrhage where you suspect a rapid fall in the BP, a development of shock. You would want to investigate it and further transfuse a whole blood or packed cells, 10 to 20 ml per kg of whole blood and a PRBC of 5 to 10 ml per kg of uh, body weight. So also uh, get a serial hemoglobin level. If there is a hemoglobin drop, yeah, then you would be suspecting a hemorrhage, internal hemorrhage also, GI hemorrhages and all of these. So shock, again, give fluids. Fluids are the mainstay of treatment here. Fluid, dengue go hand in hand. Start a patient with shock with a fluid of 20 ml per kg in the first 15 minutes itself and also repeat boluses if required and if the BP is not picking up. Only after completely volume resuscitating the patient and you feel that the patient has received enough volume even despite that the patient is having a shock, then you would want to go for a vasopressor therapy. So vasopressor therapy, again, you can talk to the intensive care and uh, discuss with the specialists uh, to choose which vasopressor for which patient. And if there are any infections that are being suspected, please do send cultures and antibiotics. And as mentioned before, you can also investigate for other endemically related in infections as well. If there is any MARTs, you can also look at organ-specific therapies. So this was the approach to your dengue. So make sure that you clinically assess the patient every single day or, or even two to three times a day. Watch for warning signs, talk to the patients, find out about the symptoms, help them symptomatically. Most of the patients can come out and uh, will not have any worsening.